everybody. Really, really welcome to the Community Eye Health Journal webinar. Um, I see we've got at attendees arriving. We've got, um, be lovely if you could put in the chat where you're from. Um, welcome, Bildad, Dorothy Chasset, Ruchi Mohammed. I'm seeing uh, Ruchi Priya, Sandeep Bhutan. Uh, Tulsi's here. Hello, Tulsi. Um, Ruth. Welcome, everybody. Gosh, we're up to 29 attendees. Anak, welcome. Hi, Anita. Anita is a member of the journal team who's joining us. Benson and Gure, Bildad, Dharma and Dawalia, welcome, everybody. Hello, Dorota. Wonderful. Oh, we're on 32 attendees. So it's just a couple of minutes, three minutes past 11. Um, we'll give a few more minutes. Hi, Daksha. Daksha is also a team member here at ICH. So, yeah, from the International Centre for Eye Health um, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, welcome, everybody, and a special welcome to our panellists here today. Um, this is our, I think, our fourth Community Eye Health Journal webinar. Here, will you op say hi, um, open up your, <clears throat> turn on your camera for us. <laughs> That'll be great. Thank you. He was our communications officer here at ICH. And without his technical wizardry and communication skills these webinars would never happen so we're really grateful to you Hugh thank you so much um, great yeah welcome um so we're going to start today so today's webinar is a combination and it's um I've got the two issues here we've got our um community engagement um journal and then we also we followed up a couple of issues later with um with the cataract I think it might be mirror image in your, you're looking at it, um, a cataract issue. And the reason we decided to combine them is because there was so much overlap um, and cataract being the biggest cause of preventable blindness um, in low and middle income countries worldwide. Um, uh, you know, and, and you can't really, you can't provide cataract services without the community being involved and engaged. Uh, people need to know about it. They need to want to come forward. Um, and customers who are satisfied will go and promote the IK service and, and convince others to come for surgery as well. Um, so we decided to combine these two issues. Um, and without any more introduction, um, I'm going to ask Fatima Kiari, uh, who's an ophthalmologist and a, um, also an IH, ICH colleague. Um, Fatima, please introduce yourself and then um, give us a, a brief overview of the cataract issue. Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. Um, I'm Fatima Kari. I work as an ophthalmologist at uh, the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital. And um, I'm also associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I would like to share my screen now and um, Okay, so um, we're just going to be talking about the improving cataract services issue, which was talking about better access, better outcomes, and better value. I would just like to acknowledge two of my residents who um, I believe thoroughly read the journal and um, came up with a summary of which this is what I have, I am presenting to you. So the focus of the issue is a balanced approach to outcomes and outlay together with strong partnerships to create a cataract service that puts patients at the center and deliver eye health for all. And what, when we talk about partnerships, what are we really talking about? So it's not just about um, the hospital because it's patient centers. It, we need to know what matters to them, ask for their feedback know what they want. And then the community can also be very useful in terms of service delivery and also in identifying cataract patients because they live among themselves, as well as after care following surgery. Then of course the hospital management where the hub of, hub of the service is, increasing the scope of sustainable service provision with a balance between income generation and cost containment. So in, in this issue, we talked about how can we balance the two? We know that we would like to um, increase the services, but it's always at a cost. And then the hospital management is always trying to cut cost or at least contain cost. So we need to know how 
else we can do the income generation and that gives us a sustainable service. Then of course, um, the eye care personnel is very important to the system, the roles, the responsibilities, and then there has to be respect within eye care personnel and team. And there has to be a transparent and fair human resources policy. So the issue talked about this and um, gave examples of how teamwork can actually increase. So these strong partnerships can help to produce a high volume, high quality and affordable cataract surgical service. Um, okay, so uh, we can't really talk about uh, a cataract service, you know, in this day like, without talking about effective cataract surgical coverage, which is the ECSD. It's the new global target um, recommended by the World Health Organization. And it's not only talking about measuring quantity, but also measuring quality. So both are measured. In the previous um, cataract surgical coverage measure, it was just about quantity, how much of um, people that need cataract surgery actually have it compared to those that um, need it. So in terms of um, who are the people that have, how many people have had cataract surgery and how many people actually need it, um, including those that have had it and those that haven't had it, which is the denominator. So this is the new global target. So it's not just about numbers. It also in, increased the, um, it also stated the visual outcome of cataract surgery as a parameter to consider. And here there's a cutoff point of a presenting visual acuity of 612 or better, which is really a high bar. In the previous WHO um, recommendation of what is good outcome is 618 or better. So this is quite a high bar, which means there has to be an improved quality. There has to be increased output. And then of course, equitable access. We have to consider children. How do we, how do children access the service and how do women access, access the service? Um, older adults, even though contract is mostly for adults, but we also need to pay special attention to how older adults access the service and of course people with disabilities. So I'll just mention a few key highlights um, of how these, was, um, these were discussed in the journal. So there are articles that focused on the patient-centered approach and we'll see the article that discussed patient feedback and how that feedback was in, in integrated into the system to improve the service of that hospital. And then the patient reported outcome measures. So we're not always fixated on um, visual outcome 612. You know, what does that mean to patients and how does that affect their um, daily living activities? For example, look at um, the photo I have here, which is um, out of the journal as well. So acknowledgement to the photo, um, the journal for the photos. Um, this is just a lady who has had cataract surgery, not, I guess it's her first day post-op and she's already back to her usual work and she's happy with it. And then there are, there is an article that also talked about service operational policies, being friendly to patients to improve access. We have to think about how we can engage patients, how we can make them happy in the environment. So there's a so there's a journal article that talks about that. Then of course, the focus on patients' needs. Then we have a few articles also that talked about teamwork and efficiency, where we have highly organized and efficient team-based approach. Um, that could be in terms of, um, of efficient oper operationalization of the system. Like what we see here is the two bedded um, theater. Even if it's one surgeon, the surgeon can swing um, quickly between the two tables, like finish one before the next one is set up, it started on, on the second table. And before the um, first table is set up, you know, the surgeon has started on the uh, other table. So it's quite efficient. And then we talk about bulk purchase. 
this has been, you know, a long term strategy. You put resources together to buy a lot of um, uh, consumables, for example, to reduce the cost. Quality mo monitoring and improving the process, shifting. Um, this article talked about shifting from uh, um, biometry, contact by ultrasound biometry to immersion ultrasound biometry, which improved the IO power prediction accuracy. And that just changed the outcome of the cataract surgery in terms of, you know, um, surgery induced refractive errors. Then taking advantage of economies of scale by sharing infrastructure and salary costs between more patients. So this teamwork and these strategies to improve efficiency are all discussed in the journal. And then finally, it's equitable access is also discussed in the journal. We have to think of how we can address the, um, those that, you know, are, that have barriers, that face specific barriers. Here we have an example of women by enhancing their experience of care, increasing their awareness, and reducing their non-medical costs. Because oftentimes when we talk about cataract ser service, um, surgical service, we think of the medical costs, but we do have non-medical costs and uh, largely women are affected. Then increasing demand and uptake. I, I think I was glad to see that a systematic review showed that um, Outreach cataract surgical services are really still very much needed. And in some communities, in some countries, that is what will really scale up demand and also uptake. Um, then reducing financial barriers, which is another key component of cataract surgical service. You have to think about multiple sources of funding. So this is it. We talked about all these three important parameters in the journal, the patient approach, the teamwork and increasing efficiency and um, ensuring equitable access. Um, thank you very much. Brilliant, Fatima. Thank you for a really thorough overview of um... <clears throat> a really complex and in-depth issue covering a huge amount of ground really grateful to you um i was just thinking you know we were we were going to go on with um with um samrana next to talk about the community issue but i just very quickly want to give a couple of minutes um to our participants are there any urgent questions um that you have about for fatima on some of the topics mentioned um, I might be able to take two questions and then I'll ask you to just jot down your questions um, for when we have a little bit of a longer time. So um, I'm just looking, there's no hands up just now. But yeah, so if you can, I think there's a way to add questions here. Could you just take us through how participants can in the webinar can post their questions? There's a there's a Q&A function, isn't yeah, definitely, it? Definitely, yeah. If everyone wants to put yeah. any questions in the Q&A um, option, yeah. Them, um, and then we can ask those to the panelists um, either now or later when we have a bit more time for questions. Um, yeah. and also the chat option as well, if you just wanted to um, put anything else in the chat that's not a question for panelists. But you yeah. can also raise your hand as well if you'd like to, to speak <laughs> um, and we can put you put your audio on as well. Fantastic. Yeah, because I'm just aware there's so, such a lot of ground that um, that Fatima has covered. Um, so yeah, we welcome your questions. So yeah, get your questions prepared for the next session. So Fatima, thank you ever so much. That was brilliant. Really, really great. Um, so Rana, can I ask you to unmute and put on your camera so we can see you? Um, and then so Rana was involved in putting together our community engagement issue. So would you take us through um, some of the key you know, findings and, and principles in that issue? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Elmin. And hi, everyone. Um, hello from Pakistan. I'm Samrana Yasmin. I'm Deputy Technical Director for our eye health and refractive error portfolio at SightSavers. Also work very closely with World Health Organization and IAPB uh, in the field of vision care. Um, so referring back to the issue on community engagement that um, Elmin talked about, 
In this issue, we explored why engaging with communities in the work that we do is crucial to ensure access to eye care for all. I'm going to share some key learning and messages that emerged from different articles. So as part of this issue, we applied a health system strengthening lens to community engagement and explored what needs to be done to ensure universal eye health coverage with a very specific focus on identifying challenges of reaching the most vulnerable population groups, and then how we can work with communities to find the right solutions. The issue also highlighted why it is important for us to involve the community, not only in the design and planning and implementation processes, but also making sure that they are engaged in monitoring the quality and impact of eye care interventions. And then their role in advocacy, that cannot be underestimated. The choices uh, of making sure that we have the right advocacy messages in place and the chances of advocacy success are always high when communities are part of it and they own it. So we all know that health system strengthening leads to equitable access to eye care. And one key message from the issue is improving eye health for all is critical to making progress towards universal health coverage. This would give access to all individual and communities to the health services that they need, where they need them, when they need them, without making sure that, without incurring any financial issues. So for this to happen, integration of eye care in universal health coverage and delivering integrated people-centered eye care for all is central. So making sure that we apply a health system strengthening framework, that's the way we will be able to address the barriers that we face in terms of inclusive service delivery, eye health workforce, data and evidence, governance and quality of care. The need to embrace technology and innovation is also highlighted and you'll find really good examples about it that we can learn from and also integrate into our work. The article on demand side financing mechanism also share really good examples and tools that can help us to increase access while making sure that we are effectively using our resources, improving the efficiency of service provider and empowering communities along the way. Next slide, please. So there is no doubt that meaningful engagement of communities is really important if we want to maximize the impact of our work. And a strong starting point is to better understand what a community needs. And that means including people with disabilities, women and girls, and other vulnerable groups. So active and continuous engagement with communities is going to help us to understand their need so we can plan and deliver eye care services accordingly. And this then is going to have a ripple effect in terms of generating demand and improving uptake of services. And we are going to hear about it from Suresh uh, fairly shortly. Social behavior change communication has also been identified as a key strategy that support communities to make long-term change in their behavior. And that includes how they look after their eye health and how and when they seek eye care. So we need to factor that into our work and also make sure that we invest in this area properly. And last but not the least, accountability. For us as a sector to be accountable to, the, to our respective communities and then also making sure that we empower communities to hold all eye care stakeholders accountable, including national and local governments. So in summary, community engagement and integrated people-centered eye care has a tremendous potential to ensure equitable, inclusive eye care that meets the need of our communities. Thank you very much. Back to you, Elmi. Hello, Samarana. Thank you so much for that amazing overview. It's such an important topic. And um, actually, when both you and Fatima were, were, were talking and I, you know, I'm always learning so much, both in putting together the issue, editing the articles, learning what all the authors are writing. And, and then when we have a chance to reflect at the webinars, <clears throat> you know, I'm 
really thinking, I think I was, even at the beginning of this meeting, I was thinking that, you know, the more we engage with the community, the more we can kind of get people to come in for services, you know, and thinking from the community as a resource, but actually with community engagement, it's about serving the community it's about being humble as ik workers um, and actually i would like the panel um to to please um put uh, put on your cameras because i think this is a really good um, place to start our panel discussion um so if everybody can in the panel please feel free to turn on your cameras you as well it'd be lovely to see you as well um yeah it's it's how do we how do we serve so maybe the first thing that's required and perhaps everybody who's here already thinks like that um it's only me who's got a slightly mercenary approach to, to eye care and healthcare, but it's to think that we are really here to serve the community and um you know in all aspects so you know women people who are usually marginalized as well so how do we reach out beyond that the eye clinic um and um, and make sure that we are engaging with communities so um, Samrana, so maybe first question to you. How how does this work in practice? Because it all is there's lots of big words and there's lots of concepts, but taking it from that United Nations World Health Organization level down to as eye care practitioners, what should eye care practitioners do? You know, do differently. How does it look in practice? I think as a starting point, Elmin, really important is the context. So we talk about community engagement from, from this bigger lens, which is looking at it from global perspective and then kicks in your regional perspective and then national. And within national, then you have your state or provincial and district level settings. Mm. And socioeconomic, cultural uh, dynamics are really different from context to context. So just making sure that we are aware of those sensitivities when we start engaging with communities is really important like from my perspective if we manage to make sure that we have a really good understanding of of the respective community let's say for example we want to start an eye care program or service then having that insight that what works for this community and making sure that we connect with all the relative stakeholders in the community to get their feedback mm -hmm. in what works for them rather than coming up with the you know blueprint recipe uh, that works somewhere else is is uh, important and then identifying within the community community champions who are our allies and help us to take this agenda forward is also going to be really critical so if we manage to uh, check these two boxes in the best possible way uh, i think we we will be on a on a good start Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much. Anybody in the panel, Faith, I see you were nodding there because you were, you were, that's your area of specialty. And we'll hear from you a little bit more later on. But just to respond to that point from Samrana, please unmute yourself and, and come in on that. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So um, I just want to, I agree so much with Samrana when she says that. Uh, you have to take a program that works for the people in that particular area and not um, uh, duplicate something else. It may not work in another place. Yes. Mm. So you have to consider so many other things before you go and uh, implement a project in an area. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you. And Demisi, I'm just looking at you because, um, you know, the article you wrote for us in the journal and the cataract issue was about um, taking an eye unit and just completely increasing, massively increasing the cataract surgical output. And that had so much to do with community engagement. So where, where do you start in practice, you know, as an eye health practitioner? It just seems like sort of a chicken and egg. You need the community to do the eye care and you need good eye care to get the community. So where's a good place to start? Yeah, thank you, Elmin. Uh, you know, I, I completely agree with what Surana said and Faze added, uh, you know, the community context is very important. And it is different with different uh, communities. If you're working in a pastoralist area or, or in a different area, the culture, the, you know, the way you address the community, the way you reach the community is different. Mm -hmm. From my perspective to your question, uh, you know, uh, I 
worked there and I was sharing my experience at Sabati Eye Hospital in Western Kenya, where I worked uh, for six years as a hospital director assigned there. Uh, uh, and looking at the potential, the uh, huge uh, catchment area the hospital covers and the need uh, around, uh, what we did was we looked at two approaches. One was uh, institution-based, you know, the service that we provide at the center uh, for those who, who come looking for the service at the center, like any other hospital. Uh, the second approach was also to reach out to the community 50, 60, 100 kilometers away where the services are not there. And we try to address their needs by going uh, out there. So the two approaches are a little bit different. The hospital-based approach worked very well. Uh, first, we worked on ourselves, on the institution, you know, building systems, bringing the capacity, in terms of looking into our equipment, our staff, uh, our working environment, our patient flow, uh, uh, you know, making it, trying to make it patient-centered uh, from the, the moment that patients come into the, uh, you know, the compound uh, uh, to be properly communicating with them, addressing their needs, respectfully, uh, you know, managing them and so on. Uh, and improving the efficiency of the system on the ground in, in, in a way like uh, where we even went to the level of probably operating patients who have come from far uh, almost the same day if they are ready and if they're you know, preparing them, counseling them. Uh, because usually we lose patients if we return them back. They, they put a lot of effort to come from 60 kilometers, you know, a blind, bilaterally blind person uh, with the help and probably sometimes they come selling their resources an ox a cow uh, and returning them back uh, is like sending them or condemning them to not to have service or not to come back and so on so we worked strongly in improving the capacity the systems on the ground worked on our staff in in the way they handle our patients more effective efficiently uh, and not giving appointments. You know, sometimes uh, you know, patients coming in the morning, sitting out there, not being attended well. All that uh, you know, brings in a negative impression by the patients and a negative uh, you know, uh, word of mouth to the community and so on. So we improved on that and that improved the institution-based service, both in numbers, in quality, and in outcome as well. The second approach was the, uh, you know, uh, the outreach service that we expanded. And there as well is where, the, especially the community engagement, the community issue comes in. The outreach services usually work strongly if you have people on different communities where you go, uh, people who reach out and who know the community, who know the culture, who know the tradition, who will reach out to them, influence them, uh, that we are coming as a team, there is the service. Uh, there should be also a good organization on the ground in terms of uh, know where you do the consultations, where do you do the surgeries, uh, and, and a very strong, you know, using local uh, radios or the churches, the public gatherings and so on, so that they reach out to the people so that people are informed. People are informed that there is a good service coming to them, so they, they benefit from that. That is an important component of the outreach service, good mobilization, uh, sending out good information. And then again, uh, still the, your, your quality of service provision, uh, you shouldn't be minimizing it uh, as much as possible, uh, uh, the quality or the standard of service that you have been offering at your center. You still keep that quality. Sometimes when you are out of your center, uh, there are challenges that will uh, hold you back a little bit and so on, but we still try to maintain that quality service and also work with uh, you know, schools, uh, other centers where the operative environment is also good enough, not substandard and so on. So uh, it's, it's mobilization, it's reaching out and working with people, influencing the community on the ground. They can be Lions Clubs, they can be community 
you know, organizations, women's organizations, and so on. So we did work with various community level organizations in terms of doing our outreach and reaching out to the needy in the outreach center. So the, the, uh, what we did was a little bit different uh, for both uh, aspects of service delivery. You are me today. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I just noticed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's really helpful to see the perspective. Both are both are usually needed, aren't they? Um, and Hannah, <clears throat> I was just looking at you. You you were involved very much with the community issue, and uh, you wrote about the last mile. You know, reaching people at the last mile. Um, and I think that that probably dovetails quite well with what Demisi was saying. That you know, having to reach so hospitals and centres need to reach right out into the community. So I just wondered if you have some thoughts and thoughts to share and tips um, and some you know, approaches or principles on that. I think much, much of what we did um, has been mentioned, but let me share very practical examples. Uh, a lot of us are in it. We would probably be an ophthalmologist or a nurse at the hospital mm -hmm. and um, I would draw from my own experience of what I had to do in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. One is to take care of, of the team at the base hospital. And one success factor was to have a person responsible for that community engagement. So we had a nurse who knew the culture and everything concerned with the community to lead on that aspect within the hospital base. Mm -hmm. Then the second point was to make ourselves understand what the community is. So at the community level, who does the patient go to? Who do they consult? What are the systems? What are the traditional? So we educated ourselves first to understand mm -hmm. what that's led by this lead person at the hospital. Then we designed a way to contact the community using this person as the lead person. Um, so in bite-sized, you cannot do the whole country at once. So you would select a geographical area and then use that person to transmit or change or understand what eye health in is with the traditional systems, the women's groups, the community health workers, just shaking hand and making friends with the community first. Mm -hmm. So they understand us and we understand them. And we made that, uh, and the third aspect was that whoever was working at the community, we helped them in a bite-sized way. We understood that they would be taking care of 5,000 population area. So the work is not too much for them. Mm -hmm. and, and then the next level would be 10,000. And whatever they were doing, the integration is so important that eye health is not seen as an a silo. It is seen as whatever else is going on in the community. And because that person is working in all other areas, the success is that if they're talking about the child, they would mention eye health. If they're measuring blood pressure, they would mention. So integrating into, into whatever they did. Um, so that, that was, so to summarize, have the person at the institution who would be responsible, have a team, that person, as Samrana said, is context familiar, context knowledgeable, and then that person would guide the rest of the team at the main hospital, and then that person would transmit and be a bridge between the institution and the, um, and the community. When we think of community, most times we think of that last mile, as you say, but the last mile could exist in the prison. The last mile could exist in schools. The last mile could exist in the markets. So that concept of that person who is not being reached is the last mile. And how do you do that? You can integrate eye health into anything they're doing in health, but you can also see them as a resource. So the health system, would be a resource. So whatever resource they are using to see the child, resource they're using to see the non-communicable diseases, you would then push in eye health into that. 
So that you use that resource because in eye health, you may not have the resources, but if you piggyback eye health into them, any other program or any other captive population, we piggyback. And, and, and that has to be an objective, a set objective with strategies and plans and people who would be responsible for integrating into, the, into those resources. The third resource that is very good is the community development. You know, the, they are responsible, say, for water or agriculture or nutrition or other non-health government systems. So integrating into that. I cannot overemphasize the point of the people at the third level or the institution having a team responsible for making this happen a bridge person that would link the tertiary to the community and a way of measuring that you're actually uh, Absolutely. being successful in, in, in those areas. So apart from measuring the quality and the quantity, let's also have a way within the team of measuring whether we are achieving that last mile, whether we are achieving the integration. Absolutely. Hannah, thank you so much. Those are powerful words. And um, I'm really glad we're recording this meeting because we're going to post the, the webinar online and we can listen back and, and take notes. I'm definitely taking notes. Thank you so much. Um, and what you're saying about measurement is so, so important. And that links back to, um, to what Demisi was saying and, and Fatima to you as well. I'm so glad you highlighted the, the effective cataract surgical rates concept when you when you spoke, because um, it actually, that's a really good measure, not only of the of the actual visual outcome, the usable visual outcome for the patient. Um, so it's not about just the number of cataract operations, it's about cataract surgery that gives people good usable vision, but it also measures that against the need, the people in the community who still need surgery. So actually now on a national level, um, it's, it's now possible, actually everybody's now being encouraged to use that as a measurement by the World Health Organization. Um, Fatima, I'm gonna. We, we're gonna. I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about that from you. I'm just aware of time. We're going to be hearing from Suresh and from Faith as well. We've got a video um, recorded an interview with Faith, but um, that's maybe um, unless there's other questions, we can come back back to that issue um, at the end of of the next two rapid fire presentations. So hold that thought. Um, I think if I'm correct, um, the next would be Faith. We're gonna hear. Will you show us the video? Faith, thank you so much. We're not hearing the sound yet. Back in ten across. So my name is Faith Langat. Um, I work in Tenwick Hospital, Bomet County, as a project manager, a coordinating vision impact project in Bomet County. Our role um, is uh, to ensure that we link, uh, we, we are uh, actually like a bridge between the patient and the healthcare system. Mm. So um, we strengthen the health the health system we use the existing health systems that are in place and we are lucky here in bomet that um, our health community health strategy is very vibrant we have mm -hmm. all the community health volunteers in all the community units it's well structured it's well managed it's well supervised such that in if you go to a community unit right now and call for the 10 community health volunteers, they'll all come. Um, so our, our role there is to link that to the to eye health. Uh, so uh, for example, um, we uh, through the Vision Impact Project, we need uh, screeners and we use community health assistance to screen. So our role here is to ensure that the community health assistant gets the best and very high quality training on identification and uh, prevention and referral of eye problems. 
uh, or eye conditions. So we take them through a rigorous uh, three days uh, training on primary eye care and disability inclusive in uh, disability uh, inclusive development uh, training. And uh, we also do a five days training on PIC because this is the system that we use in referral, in, in identification also, and refer in data collection and referral of our, of our patients. So we ensure that they are well trained. We also uh, um, train them to mentor the community health as, uh, volunteers because we don't train the community health volunteers. So we train them so that as they work with the community health volunteer, he mentors them so that once they leave, then we have a sustainability plan so that the community health volunteers will also be sensitive that we need to refer patients who have white spots or patients with allergies or the teary red eyes or children who have um, uh, squints, we need to refer them. So, um, so we ensure that they get good training. We also train uh, OSUP or Orthomic Skills Upgrade course to nurses and clinical officers. This also maintains, uh, this with our staff who will work in the dispensaries and health centers. So we take the services closer home to the people. So we also ensure that they also undergo a three months training here in Tenwick Hospital. And uh, by the time they go back to their facilities, they're able to identify, treat, and also refer cases to either the secondary facility, which is our county referral hospital, or to Tenwick Hospital. Uh, they also, of course, um, uh, uh, conduct the treatment outreaches mm -hmm. together with uh, staff from the county referral hospital and the tertiary facility general hospital. So they also conduct the treatment outreaches. So mm -hmm. by providing them that quality training, then in the treatment outreaches, we we don't we minimize the chances of missing out on very important yet critical uh, aspects. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm so glad you can be with us today as well, Faith. That was great. Um, I think just a very quick question. I'd love you to elaborate on, I mean, you do a huge amount of training and enthusing people in the community to, to, to engage and train. It's a, it must take a huge amount of energy. So how, how do you motivate community members, um, sorry, these different volunteers and, and, you know, role players, as Hannah was talking, all these different people who are already engaging with communities, how do you get them enthusiastic about eye health and, and um, you know, achieve what you do? Please unmute yourself, yeah, there we go, thanks. Okay, so um, uh, for us, uh, eye health here in Bomet County, it's like something that is uh, new. Uh, we know, of course, there is high health, but to the community volunteers, it's something that is relatively uh, programs that have not been done, if I can say so. So uh, people are really still very excited, very enthusiastic mm -hmm. about it. Uh, you teach somebody and already they are saying they, are, they can relate to a person they saw in the community or even their own relatives. So um, we are not having a bit of a challenge uh, getting them interested. Also in the community, people are really interested. They come in very large numbers to the treatment outreaches. And so it's very important that we maintain very high standards of training, both for the, the screeners and also for the healthcare, health, health staff. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Faith. Brilliant. I'm gonna move on quickly to Suresh um, um, to talk to us about, because Suresh, you, your article was really kind of started off during the pandemic. Yes. And, and um, so please introduce yourself, take us through what you've done, and then um, I'm going to open up the floor for the panelists to ask any questions of both Faith and yourself, or both of you, about your work. Um, and then um, also open up to our, our um, participants and attendees at the webinar. So please start 
jotting down your questions. You can start putting questions in the Q&A as soon as you're ready. Um, but Suresh, please take it away. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Elman. Yes, I'm sharing my slides. So good evening to all and thanks for the opportunity for sharing the work that has been done by partners of LICO and LICO is also a part of the member because this is a collective work done by roughly 14 high hospitals. So uh, along with me there is Mr. Yesu Nason who was a part who was a uh, principal author of this um, article. Okay, So this basically was an initiative that was being started during the time of uh, COVID, when all of us have been uh, stuck with the COVID lockdowns and uh, and we are not uh, doing any outreach programs to reach out to the communities to take care of their eye care. So this is when it started. So as we all know, I saw, I saw Hanafa Madam talking about the demand side challenges and Fatima talking about all those aspects. So during the time of pandemic, it was much worse because we were not sure when we will be, when the demand will rebound and when we will have access to all these patients to take care of eye care. And we also don't know when we will be organizing outreach program. And we are also not sure whether the during the time of lockdown, whether the patient perspectives and expectations from the providers also might have changed. So everything we had only the questions in our mind, but we never had any answers to those questions when we started this program. And uh, as all of us in this forum will agree that uh, uh, that outreach program is one of the key strategies that we all apply in a day-to-day -day situation to reach out to the community members. But the outcome of the uh, program which you will see is that there is a lot more people that needs to be served. So in a way or other we need to identify an alternative strategies or a supplement to an existing ICAMP activities. So thanks to COVID which has pushed us to think of some supplement to an uh, existing program that is a community outreach program. So really we must thank the COVID for giving us this opportunity. Uh, so, as Hanako Madam was telling, uh, I like the words she was reaching the last mile. So, also uh, taking that into the context also, like if you want to provide an eye care to the community, we ne somebody needs to own it. So, whether we can make that community organization within the community own the eye care problems of the community. Whether the students eye care, uh, whether the students can, uh, whether the schools can own the eye health of their students whether the industries uh, because you want to with the if the industry wants to be more productive their employees needs to have a good vision whether they can own the eye care problems of their industry of their employees and also how do we best build the referral network among all these organizations as well as within the community if all these people take an ownership in their own community then almost like what hana madam was telling that we will be able to try to reach the last mile in the community so this was the big challenge that we had where we were thinking of having it so now if you see everybody we have been talking about the all the outreach program what we do is most most likely is driven by the hospitals so can we make a shift instead of having an hospital driven out, out, outreach program to a community driven outreach program so that there is an ownership within the community so that they can drive the outreach program irrespective of the providers whoever is there so this was the approach which we have taken during those period and uh, it was an it was a collaborative program uh, so there were 14 eye hospitals who came forward during that time to pilot this initiative and there are 11 eye hospitals from india one from bangladesh one from kenya and one from nigeria and uh, even though we have taken seven approaches in this uh, pilot but in the paper, if you will see, we, will, we have reported only six approaches, which is related to the community-related programs. One approach was extremely on the secondary, second eye cataract surgery, which you are not reported because it is not exactly related with the community engagement program. That was the only reason which why you will see only the six approaches mentioned in the paper. And in this program, Aravind Eye Hospital was a part of a learner. We also, our hospitals also engaged in this program. In the 11 hospitals, there are two eye hospitals of Aravind Eye Hospital. If you see this uh, outcome, uh, really we are uh, very much happy because in the eight, because it started, everything started in the February, 
2021 and it ended in the September 2021. If you see during this eight months period, all these 14 I hospital has performed a total surgeries of 20,900 cataract surgery. And interestingly, 18 percentage of their cataract surgeries, which is close to 4,000 surgeries, came through the approaches what they implemented during this eight months period. Uh, so I will go through this uh, in brief, considering the time, I will just briefly go through what are these seven approaches we try to implement, which the partners try to implement in their hospitals. If you see the first one, which I told we have not reported in the article, which is on the other eye cataract surgery, because we know that if there's a pseudophagic patient, if he's coming for a uh, routine eye examination, the other eye can be operated. So that is the first approach we have taken. And then the second approach is that, as uh, Demisi was mentioning about in his thing, the patient should be satisfied so that whether it is within the hospital or outside the hospital. So we have taken that as an one of the thing. The patients, those who are satisfied by receiving the services in the hospital, whether they can be motivated to refer further from the patients in their community to the hospitals. So how do we leverage the existing satisfied customer of our own services, whether it can be an outreach program or it can be a hospital-based program? So how do we leverage the existing satisfied patients, those who can refer patients? And then in the during the pandemic, we are not supposed to uh, conduct a huge gatherings to uh, undertake an outreach program. So there is a hospital will undertake uh, this approach of having a mini, they termed as a mini screening program where they will target only one village in a day. If we, it, either it can be in one village or a two village in a day where it is only minimum two or three people goes. Like for an example, an ophthalmic assistant uh, and a driver and a counselor. So three member team will go, they will they will not do mic announcement publicity, they will mobilize the patient with the help of the community members. And then they bring the patients uh, not more than 15 to 20 in a, um, like maximum is 15 is their what, minimum 10 to 15 is what they bring in a bus with, a, with all social distancing. So they used to organize small, small camps in each villages, even though it's a time consuming, but they used to get a good outcome out of those programs. Then, as we all know that the, the, the hospitals, those who have been engaged already with the community partnership or with the community members, they have a very, very trustworthy community members. So again, how do we leverage these community members or a philanthropist or a, like for an example, any school teachers or a priest who are there in the community, who is a well-wisher of the organization, how do we leverage them so that they can refer directly patients to the hospitals? So in this also, we have done a lot of referral uh, because we don't want, because during the pandemic, we don't want the patients to come for an eye examination and go back without surgery because of any systemic problem or some other thing. So we had a very good referral card where the patients before coming to the hospital, they will undergo, they will they will measure their blood pressure, they will measure plus random blood sugar. If needed, they will get their physician opinion. Then they come for the surgery so that there is a dropout of the patients who has come for the surgery has not been sent back without any surgeries. And also it was full freedom given to the community members to, to let us know in the referral letter whether this patient will be able to pay for the surgeries or he, the hospitals need to treat him for free of cost. Because of the trust that the hospital and the community has, the, the all the hospitals has accepted whatever been recommended by the community members. If the community members tells, please treat this patient as a free patient, he was given free surgery. If he was advised that please try to collect only the subsidized charge, it was adhered. So those who need a FECO surgeries or something, then they used to give us a paying surgery. So the, the, the trust that between the community and the hospital had a huge impact on this. Then the, there's another program which was exclusively implemented only in Kenya, which is a door-to-door -door screening by, by a cataract finder. In this program, what they did is typically they have enrolled, engaged two community members. It is persons from those community who were being trained in a primary eye care in the visual acuity, understanding eye, eye problems. And they were given, and also in addition to all this uh, examination kit, they were given a motorbikes. So they used to, you will see the photographs in the article also. So they used to go in the motorbike in the community 
screen the primary screening. They will do the primary screening and try to identify all the cataract patients and also refer them to the base hospital for the surgery. If in turn, they were not, if the patients are far away, they are not able to go on their own to the hospital. Once in a week, they have to collect the patient, those who identify the cataract surgery. The hospital used to send the vehicle to pick them up for the service and also drop them back. And then the one more approach which, which, which worked very well in the eastern and the western part of the country of India is uh, here I uh, really I, I accept that that way that the that all the service what we provide, it needs to be customized as per the community. So this program was very successful only in the eastern part and the western part of the Indian country, where the hospitals try to tie up with the already practicing optometrists in the community. So they were already selling glasses, uh, dispensing glasses to the public. So the, the hospitals made a very good memorandum of understanding with the optometrists. So that the people coming over there, if they have any cataract and any other, if their patients need any other eye services, they refer to the particular hospital for eye surgeries. In turn, this up to, in so turn, this up. Just finish your thought, eh? go for it. Yes, yes, yes. In turn, this optometrists were benefited by the follow-up because the post-operative glasses was been given by uh, these um, the optometrist. Fantastic. That's that's such a good time with the existing system. I'm going to unfortunately have to stop you there because we, yes. we won't want to have a bit of time for questions. And I know some of the panelists will have to leave in, in one minute. But thank you so much, Rishi. There's, there's lots more information on that article um, in the journal itself. So please have a read. Um, and it very much dovetails with what everyone else has been saying about working with those existing systems. So, so well done. Thank you for sharing sharing that with us. And sorry we had to cut you short. Um, I, I, before we open up for questions, I'm very, very quickly just going to share a link in the chat um, as soon as I can work out how to get to the chat. Um, we have a very quick few minute survey um, that I'm just going to share with everybody. It's a link. So um, let me just see if I, oh, hang on a minute, it's not working. Anyway, I'll share it as soon as I can. Um, we would love you to fill out a survey just to give us some feedback about the webinar um, and, um, you know, and any feedback on that. But let's start with the questions. There's um, a comment from Tulsi to agree that he's also experienced some challenges there. Um, and then Boniface Madishona says, uh, community-driven outreach is an interesting innovation. It brings a sense of ownership of the program to the community. And we're really keen to have um, details of the findings of that collaborative research effort. So um, thank you for sharing your email address there, um, Mandishona. So I think that's probably a question, something for, for you, Suresh. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, so please um, take, we'll share that those details. Um, it's really, really fantastic research. So please raise your hands. I'm just thinking, um, Hugh, would you come back on camera and just see how we can ask people to... Um, to ask questions, how, what's the best way? So we've got, um, to see, thank you. Uh, just raise their hands in the, in the, um, uh, at the bottom with your reactions, you can raise hand um, and then we can allow you to speak. Um, yes. I'm not sure if I'm seeing anyone right at the moment. Um, and I've just put the link in the chat. Um, it's a bit, dot, it's, bit.ly forward slash cehjweb and we would be delighted if you could um, pop in there and um, and ask you know and just let us know what you thought of the webinar and and what we can do so any other questions um anything i'm just uh, demisi thank you for putting up your hand yeah, please go for yeah, it yeah no it, it is interesting to uh, to hear from uh, uh, fatma uh on on the patient uh, reported outcome quality you know measures which is prom uh mm -hmm. which is interesting which probably measures not only like we're routinely doing the visual acuity and compares uh, the vision of the patient but uh, it, it tends to measure the quality of life that cut that cataract surgical outcome has brought to the patient is there any comparison or any correspondence done between the two? Uh, because that one uh, tends to be more objective. Uh, and is there any correspondence or like matching in terms of uh, uh, analysis of how do the two come together uh, you know, in, in reality? Is there any study done uh, to prove that? Uh, 
because I, I read on the article, but I didn't get to that level uh, of a detail to understand it better. Uh, yeah, yes, and Demisi, thank you for bringing this up. Actually, I was also going to talk about that, you know, um, the effective cataract surgical recovery really talks about visual acuity um, in relation to the quality of the cataract surgery. And we have things like patient-related outcomes. There hasn't, I haven't really seen a study that compares the two, um, or maybe to correlate the two, more to say. But what I have seen is studies that even with poorer visual, poorer visual outcomes, patients are still happy and satisfied. You know, so um, I think there's a lot more to um, patient satisfaction and patient related outcomes more than just the visual acuity. So that is one of the things that we actually look at when we're um, discussing the effective cataract surgical coverage because it's focusing more on the visual acuity. But there are other outcomes, just like I was going to even mention, like the Sabatia Eye Hospital. There are other outcomes that have actually improved the experience, the patient experience, and even the post-operative you know, um, patient experience, not just the visual acuity. So there are so many parameters that need to be considered, but I think, it's just about setting a standard and setting, um, should I say, a consistent, perhaps, parameter that can be measured across board. So we, we give the visual acuity in terms of effective cataract surgical coverage, notwithstanding that it actually gives um, some kind of pressure on the system, especially in the systems where we cannot really produce that kind of out output. Like in Nigeria, I know I've only seen one, one survey, one um, documentation of where they actually reached the WHO recommendation for good in 80% of those that had cataract surgery. And now we're even raising the bar. We're making it 612 rather than you know the previous 618. So it's really going to be a bit of a pressure. I think we need more support, not just in terms of skills, but also in terms of resources. The, the kind of resources that would, how do we measure the prediction of the post-op um, um, you know, visual outcome? How do we get the intraocular lenses that that person requires gauged on um, the, the ultrasound or the recommended IOL? So these are really things that we have to put in place before we can actually say we need to have that effective cataract surgical coverage. If not, we'll continue to have those quality gaps, you know, reflecting on our books. So I think we should also delve in other, other outcomes that really help the patient. Fantastic. That's brilliant, Fatima. Thank you so much. Um, Nasira, I would like to invite you to, to speak, please. You've got a question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, not necessarily a question, really, but to add to comment just raised by Fatima, that it, it could be a pressure in raising the bar. We currently support a state eye care program to implement outreaches while the program then its human resource capacity in one of the states in Nigeria. Quality was a watchword from the beginning back in 2018, 2019. And uh, our quality measure then was 618. And then with the effective coverage now, it's, it's back to now a higher threshold of 612. And I recall we, we we started without biometry and our quality was around 50% or there about. So resources had to be pulled to enable us to have biometry. Now we do biometry and then you have the IOS challenge. You do biometry, you don't have the actual range of powers. So sometimes we had to cancel patients because the IOL were completely off what ordinarily we provide for an outing. So we had to be shedding them. So, and at the moment we are 
around 70 percent first day post off. So it is, it's, it's really a pressure, but like you said, we, we are trying to build up the resource, insist on skills, support each other, because usually you have a team of surgeons, you need to support each other to see each one improving over time. And happily, we are, we are all reasonably happy that we are, we are growing. I think that's my contribution to that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Fatima, did you want to just comment on that? No, so, I absolutely mm -hmm. agree with him, you know. Um, and that is just what I'm saying. He just brought out, you know, from the field experience, which is actually what is going on and on all that. So I think resources, you know, supporting the practitioners to provide the resources, I mean, to have the resources to provide that quality is very crucial. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and on that point, uh, we've gone slightly over time, but I hope you'll agree that it was really worth it. Nasira, thank you so much. It was really good to hear from you. Um, and a huge thank you to all of our panelists and all of you for attending. I hope you uh, saw the link in the chat. I'll post it one last time. We'd love to hear feedback from you about the review. And if you have any further questions, there's some, uh, some free text. Please feel free to add them there. And um, all of your input and feedback will you know, either go into future journal articles or journal topics um, or into future webinars. So we're really keen from, to hear from our readers about your needs. Um, and a final huge thank you to Hugh, our comms officer. Um, if you, I never have your title right, so, sorry. Um, uh, uh, just for, for arranging the webinar and um, yeah, for, for keeping everything going and all the technical side. I'm so grateful for your time. And again, thanks to the panelists and all of you. Please keep reading the journal. Tell your colleagues about it. Um, tell them about the webinar. We'll send out a link, I think, um, Hugh, to all the everybody who's registered. You'll get an email with the link um, uh, you know, to all the recordings and so on. It will be on our website as well. So yeah, keep on, keep on going. And thank you for all the work you do to improve eye health globally. Really appreciate all of you. Have a lovely rest of your day and a good week. Bye Thanks bye. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, bye, bye. bye. Thank bye, you so bye. much. Bye. bye.